This is Matthew Cratters, Bitcoin University. Today I want to make a video about bootstrapping Bitcoin. And this video is a follow-up to yesterday's video about Caspo, which proved to be very controversial indeed. So I encourage you to watch that if you want to understand some of the background to this video, but it's not strictly speaking necessary. We're going to be talking about proof of work and how you bootstrap a network, a new network or a network like Bitcoin. Now, proof of work is definitely the best consensus mechanism for reasons we've spoken about in previous videos. And under proof of work, miners can be paid in two different ways for their work. They can be paid by the issuance of new coins. This is great, but it unfortunately dilutes existing holders of coins through monetary inflation. So you don't want to do this forever, or you'll just end up with something like fiat where you have endless dilution. Miners can also be paid through transaction fees. In other words, by people paying transaction fees who use the network. This is great, but miners will starve if there's not enough demand, if there's not enough people who want to use the network for transactions. Now, Satoshi's compromise when he created Bitcoin was to bootstrap the network in the following way. You pay miners with newly issued coins at the beginning, since there's minimal demand to use a new chain or a new network for transactions, and hence transaction fee revenue in the first few years will be low to non-existent. And then you want to slowly wean those miners off of new issuance by having the reward every four years, or in the case of Bitcoin, every 210,000 blocks. And then hope and pray that transaction fee revenue is able to rise enough over that period to compensate miners for declining revenue from the issuance of new coins. Now, what does failure mode look like under a situation like this? Failure mode one would be not enough people are interested in using your new money, and so miners starve from a lack of transaction fee revenue. Failure mode number two, as on-chain usage grows, you keep increasing the block size in order to keep transaction fees low for everyone, and this is just a temporary solution that makes people feel good, but it has bad long-term effects because it prevents a robust transaction fee market from developing. Since if a given block is not full, you can always bid the lowest fee. For example, for Bitcoin, it's one sat per V-byte. You can always bid the lowest fee and still get included. And so you don't have any fee price pressure that can help to pay miners. So why not just have giant blocks full of transactions and make up with quantity what you've lost in pricing in terms of transaction fees? Many problems with giant blocks that have been explored over the years, more node storage needed, more node verification work needed, more internet bandwidth needed for initial block download, and also takes longer for larger blocks to propagate globally across the internet because there's more data involved. So you can have uh, latency issues and delay issues in terms of propagating blocks and giving the nodes time to verify them as well. Now, at the same time that miners are negotiating this difficult transition from block subsidy revenue to transaction fee revenue, you need to hope that enough different kinds of people from all over the world get interested in using your money and running a node. And here's where Bitcoin got really lucky. At this point, 93.9% .9 of all Bitcoin of the 21 million has been mined, and there are currently 19,400 reachable nodes. There are many more nodes than that, but that's the number that are reachable. Other cryptos like Casper, for example, which we discussed yesterday in that video, even though, even though it does many, many things right, like running on proof of work and not having a pre mine, it may not be so lucky. So for example, as of today, 83.9% of CASPA has been mined, but there are only 280 nodes out there. At a previous point, Bitcoin had many, many more nodes than this. I'm taking my data from here. Here's the percentage issued of Bitcoin, 93.9%. This is the number of reachable nodes. And then the total nodes is 55,000, 56,000. For CASPA, we can see here, this is where I'm taking my data, 83.91% mined. And then this is the number of nodes, just uh, what did we say, just a couple hundred, 280 nodes globally. And they are really running out of time because by July 10th, 2026, in other words, almost two years from now, 95% of all CASPA will have been mined. And if organic demand for transacting using CASPA does not grow between now and then, then CASPA's miners may be in trouble. Remember, proof-of-work miners have real-world costs, hardware, electricity, and thus need to be compensated in some way, either through new issuance, which is bad for existing holders, as we said previously, or through transaction fee revenue. And I think that CASPA's very fast issuance schedule as compared to Bitcoin helps to juice the project at the beginning, certainly 
but at the expense of growing a long-term mining ecosystem. But you don't have to take my word for this. You can take it from someone who's actually been mining Caspa. I thought this was an interesting exchange on Twitter. Maximal Mining saying, I sold over 10 million CAS over time at various local tops. I mined in the early days of the network. This protocol is just yet another ship coin. It exists only to enrich its founders and to make gains off of nothing special. Special After its first cycle, it'll suffer the altcoin curse as all do. And then a follow-up, no regrets. I buy hardware, I mine, I provide liquidity, and buyers are the liquidity. These are the naive retail investors who buy Caspa. They are the ones who are buying from maximal mining and allowing him to pay for his hardware equipment. It looks like he's pretty much a Bitcoiner. He says, no Lambo, I don't buy stupid things I don't need. More ASICs, more Bitcoin, that's it. That's what he uses his profits to buy. Altcoins only exist as a means to accumulate more Bitcoin and capital. Been at it since 2011, seen all the crypto BS. And then Maximal Mining makes a comment, which was really the inspiration for this video. Caspa has little to no network effect and cannot sustain a fee-based subsidy in the least, especially not with how fast the emission schedule has been. This is basically a good summary of this video so far. Bitcoin has been very fortunate to survive the ongoing transition from block subsidy revenue to transaction fee revenue for the miners. And most of this is attributable to Bitcoin's fiat price going up as well. Now, why has Bitcoin's fiat price gone up and its purchasing power gone up? It's because its foundation is a fanatical group of hodlers who aren't just sitting around waiting for a pump so that they can dump their coins and move on to the latest new shiny object crypto. These hodlers, they buy a little Bitcoin like I did, then they start to go down the rabbit hole and they get hooked. They start to run their own nodes, which helps to solve that previous node bootstrapping problem that we were talking about at the beginning of this video. These hodlers also demand to be paid in Bitcoin over time. The further they go down the rabbit hole, they begin to encourage merchants to accept Bitcoin and merchants want to begin to accept Bitcoin because they have very wealthy customers who want to give them Bitcoin in exchange for goods and services. And both this demand to be paid in Bitcoin and this encouraging of merchants to accept Bitcoin, not to mention all the transaction fees you need to do when you're hodling, when you move from one cold storage uh, solution to another cold storage solution. All of these actions help to create transaction fee revenue for miners and helps them to transition away from block subsidy revenue. In addition, over time, these hodlers are hardened and personally transformed by their hodling journey. And the volatility ensures that only the strong survive. They become stronger men and women. They move from high time preference living to low time preference living. And this is something that Bitcoin and certainly hodling Bitcoin teaches you over time. It teaches you to value and make long-term plans. These people, these hodlers begin to prioritize exercise and good nutrition because they're moving to a lifestyle of more low time preference living. And they go out in the world and build amazing things since they're not glued to their monitors trying to trade the latest crap coin. And as they become more and more low time preference, they decide to get married and create new Bitcoiners the old fashioned way and then raise them with good nutrition and good low time preference Bitcoiner values. This is why it's impossible for new coins to compete with this new Bitcoiner pipeline or assembly line because it's so organic and it has such a strong culture. You can't manufacture a culture like this. It really needs to be bootstrapped quietly over many years. And we're lucky that Bitcoin culture evolved to be this way. And this is why it's impossible for newer coins to compete. They all end up being flashes in the pan or pump and dumps unable to achieve long-term organic demand and growth and unable to leave that bootstrapping phase and enter a more mature phase, which is where Bitcoin is now. This is why when it comes to cryptocurrencies, there's really only Bitcoin. There is no second best. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit the subscribe and like buttons. Hit the notification bell if you want to be notified when I publish my next video. And let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. Thanks all for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.